What is up? Welcome to another edition of the Fantasy Life Podcast. I am Marcus Grant, joined by Dwayne McFarland, fresh out of the bunker. And here we are. It is week 15. It is start of the fantasy playoffs in a ton of leagues. I know the, the high stakes leagues have already been there for a couple of weeks. But Dwayne, here we are. No pressure. We just have to help people win fantasy championships. But I feel like we are up for the task. I, I feel like we're up for it, too. You know, I'm in a lot of those high stakes leagues. So the way I look at it, those are just practice rounds to get everybody really ready for their home league championships, right? That's what we're here for is to really help everybody. And so I'm super excited about it. We've got just tons of stuff going on right now from a utilization perspective for us to dive into. And, and you know, Marcus, like the injuries, like they just never, ever, ever, ever stop. I feel like, you know, so I write the newsletter, you know, two times a week. Right now I'm doing three times with Pete being out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're ever struggling for a headline, you know, or for an intro, like you always know, there's just going to be an injury. Like you can always count on it that, you know, you can go to the injury carousel and you will have your intro if nothing else is really popping out at you for the day. And obviously that theme continued this past weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a number of really big, important injuries. We'll probably get into some of those. Also, as Dwayne mentioned, the utilization report, which is out. You can get, check that out at fantasylife.com. But let's start with... Maybe the biggest injury of the week. It happened on Monday Night Football. Kyler Murray, uh, unfortunately, has a torn ACL. He is done for the season, and it may be a while before we see him on a football field again. The Cardinals now turn to Colt McCoy to get them through the remainder of this season. Now, in terms of the, their playoff chances, pretty much a wrap for them. But... Big implications here, Dwayne, because we're, we're obviously not starting Colt McCoy, but we are starting DeAndre Hopkins. We're starting Hollywood Brown. We're starting James Conner. How much of a hit do these guys take with no Kyler Murray at quarterback? I think it does hit the ceiling, especially for Hopkins and Hollywood. I think the floor is still kind of the same. Honestly, like the floors passing wise, passing yardage wise of Kyler and of Colt McCoy have kind of been similar. But what we were hoping for was the narrative we kind of had been telling ourselves, and it seemed like things might be heating up right before the bye, is we've got Hollywood back. We have him together with DeAndre Hopkins. We've only seen that for two games now. It had been one game coming into Monday night. And the idea being also that we had James Conner back healthy. Now I know Zach Ertz was out. Rondell Moore also potentially going to be back next week. The idea was, well, maybe for the stretch run, we truly have all these guys together, and we could see that upside that we hope to see from – the Cardinals offense. I will say, I don't necessarily see that happening with Colt McCoy. The floor probably be pretty similar, but if we're trying to crush a league, like we're, we're banking on upside here. And I do think that is gone with Kyler out of the picture. I think the other risk here, Marcus, and we've talked about this with a few teams, what's the incentive to keep playing a guy like DeAndre Hopkins? Right. What's the incentive to keep playing Hollywood Brown, who's already had a foot injury this year? James Conner, you know, who is an injury prone running back. Like, I mean, the Cardinals technically aren't math mathematically like completely eliminated right now. But like, do we really think they're going to make a push? With Colt McCoy? <laughs> I mean, you lose another game. You know how it gets, man, at the end of the year. Like these guys can have a hangnail. And, you know, if it's a veteran and they don't feel like they have to play them, like they'll shut them down. And so there's just a lot of added risk, in my opinion, for the Cardinals now. And, and Hopkins is a huge one because like if you go and look at a lot of the teams that are making the playoffs, like, yeah, Josh Jacobs is the biggest name you see. Travis Kelsey is huge. But another one that I noticed a ton, people that drafted DeAndre Hopkins in round seven, eight, nine of their draft, like he's really come through down the stretch. In fact, I mean, I saw it for me personally. Like, I want to say 60% of my teams that made it in the playoffs had DeAndre Hopkins on them because he had just come through as someone that you got as a late round pick. It was really, honestly, like basically a wide receiver one. He's been a wide receiver one. He was going to be more like a wide receiver two with Hollywood back. But now, like his ceiling is his ceiling has just really been lowered. I mean, he's still going to get his targets and everything, but you just don't see a major explosion anymore, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think that was the the point, though. You you, you hit on it, though. Right? People drafted him sort of as a, a third or fourth wide receiver. So if you have already a good wide receiver one, you basically had two of them once yeah. he came back, and now you're you're sort of losing that in a really key part of the season. And I think it's it's very concerning about what the Cardinals do if they do start to shut these guys down, knowing that uh, look for all intents and purposes, the playoffs are pretty much out of reach, even if it's not uh, a mathematical situation for them. On the other side in that game, Ramondre Stevenson ended up leaving with an ankle injury did not come back and we saw other guys Pierre Strong uh Kevin Harris in fact we were all we were all watching this sort of together uh you know and, and having our own little second screen watch party 
And we saw a guy named Harris score a touchdown. And I know I was confused. I was like, wait, I didn't think Damian Harris was playing. Uh, and he wasn't. It was Kevin Harris that scored a touchdown. So now we have more confusion in the Patriots' backfield. Anybody there that, that piques your interest if and when uh, Ramondre Stevenson has to sit out games? Yeah, and we don't know for sure on Ramondre. Um, he was asked about it after the game. You know, would he play next week? And all he could say was hope so. But obviously the latest data point we have is they shut him down in a game that they needed to win. So that's not encouraging. But if I had to put a chip somewhere, I think it's really like, can Damian Harris get himself in shape to play? Um, you know, he had a, he's, he's dealing with a, a thigh injury that has shut him down for the last two games. You know, and Harris is a guy that he's battled quite a few injuries, but we've seen Harris when he's out there, like he can be productive. Like we just don't know that for sure with Kevin Harris. We don't know that for sure with Pierre Strong Jr. Now volume is king. But this last week, it was really a split between those two. Once we saw Ramondre Stevenson out of the game, it was almost a 50-50 split in snaps. It was almost a 50-50 split in rushing attempts. Pierre Strong ended up with more in the end because he did get the last drive, which really didn't mean anything. I want to say he had three or four carries on that drive, which made it, which made it kind of look like it was more like a 70-30 split in the rushing uh, department. But it was it was closer than that. So I think it's going to be pretty tight you know, between those two guys, I think it's going to be tough for us to know which one we could trust. I probably wouldn't trust either one of them, like going into a playoff matchup, unless we just really got more specific information. Hint, we're not going to get that from Bill Belichick. There's no way you're going to get any kind of insight <laughs> telling you which way they're going to lean on this. Where I would go, though, is if we hear Damian Harris is good to go, full practice by the end of week, that kind of thing, I would feel really good about playing him because I think that there would be a chance for him to really not completely have the Ramondre role, but maybe have 65% of the touches in the backfield, which, you know, if he's up to it and he's healthy, we know that he can be, he can, he's a guy that can produce. We've seen it in the past. And we've also seen the Patriots be willing to really lean into their running game. So I think those would all be positives for Damian Harris. Yeah. I just think, you know, if it's not Harris, if it's not Stevenson, I think I'm probably out because you're talking about two guys that uh, we just don't know a lot about in an offense that isn't generating a whole lot in terms of points or yards or that sort of thing. So if it's not one of the two main guys, uh, I'm staying away, especially when the fantasy matchups mean so much for people uh, at this part of the season. Seems like a good way to get into the utilization report, which, as I've mentioned, you can always check out at fantasylife.com. And let's start at running back this week because Nick Chubb, uh, Look, sometimes I get questions about, should I start Nick Chubb versus, you know, some guy who's like a maybe an RB2? And I'm like, the answer is always start Nick Chubb. Now, lately, it hasn't necessarily worked out great. The numbers have been just okay. They haven't been Chubb-like. But you've got him as an upgrade this week. I, I would, I'm excited about it. I just want to hear why. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's why on the show sheet I put, like, wait, what? Because I, <laughs> I, I said, wait, what? Once I saw the data. And I was sitting here looking at it. I'm like, okay, Nick Chubb. Dwayne, you're going to tell people over the last four weeks that they're pissed, right? Because if you mm -hmm. early in the season, if you had Nick Chubb, you had a top six back and you were live, you were loving life. The last four games, there's a chance like if you didn't have reinforcements, like he might have knocked you out of the playoffs. Like he's been RB24. He had a nice RB8 finish, but then RB37 and RB26. One of those matchups was against the freaking Texans and we got nothing out of it. So when you see that, like it, you immediately think, no, Nick Chubb, like he's on, he's a, he's trending down Dwayne. He's trending down, not up. But see, that's the thing with the utilization report. We're not as worried about necessarily the outputs. It does matter. We're more worried though, about what are the inputs? Like how often is a player on the field? When are they on the field? What, what are their touches look like? You know, what are the shares like? So here's the big thing that I'm noticing Marcus, like, and we have never seen this in the history of Nick Chubb, his entire history. He's never had the passing downs. Over the last four games, here's his role in the two-minute offense. 70%, 50%. He had a 0% in a week where they hardly used it at all, but then another one at 50%. Like, he's usually 0%, period. Like, just does not get involved at all in the two-minute offense. You might see 5%, 15%, here or there. And so his route participation over the last two games, 49%, 42%. I know a lot of people are like, ah, oh, that's nothing. It's kind of a big deal for someone like Chubb because really we're seeing him in his largest role that we've ever really seen. And, you know, they've already shown a willingness to basically give him 60% of the rushing attempts. We're used to they would keep him more at like 50. So that's already been there. And now we're potentially getting a little bit more work in the passing game. And it all just points to a really good opportunity for him to explode. Um, and even if he wasn't getting this passing down work, Marcus, I would say the biggest thing is he's just kind of been unlucky. 
you know, he's not playing bad. Like if you look at his efficiency across all the things we care about, yards after contact, you know, uh, missed tackles, force per attempt, PFF rush grade, all those things, man, he still grades in the very, very top echelon of the league. So my thought process on Nick Chubb is unless we think he's suddenly a bad running back, then there's no way. To, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, and I don't know how you would get to that conclusion. I'm with you. I can't get there. Um, he's just due. Now, the matchups the next couple of games are not necessarily great. He gets the Ravens and then he gets the Saints. But at the same time, like you're telling me you're going to give me Nick Chubb and, and, you know, a role where he's getting the most opportunity he's ever seen in his career. Uh, I'm just going to take it. Like I'm just going to bet on Nick Chubb. Right. So that's where this was a very interesting one this week um, to go through because it just kind of surprised me too. I was like, whoa, like this is like, you know, this is crazy that he's getting this kind of utilization. Question though about this, Kareem Hunt really has has underperformed. I think that's putting yeah. it lightly so far this year. And I'm trying to make a case for like, is it worth holding on to him just in the event that something happens to Nick Chubb? Like, if you have Kareem Hunt, do you hang on just if something happens in the next couple of weeks, hoping that maybe he steps into that opportunity, or is it just at this point is is it just a wasted roster spot? No, I think he fits in that you know that bucket you just mentioned. Like, he's a contingency upside kind of play, right? He's a break glass in case of emergency, RB4, if you had to right now. But really where his value comes is what you just mentioned. If something did happen, and we don't want that to happen, but if something right. did happen with Chubb, we just, we just spent, you know, how much time talking about all these injuries in the carousel. <laughs> it can strike at any moment. And yes, Kareem Hunt has not been near as good this year. Um, but man, a lot of it's been in the passing game. It's almost like this David Njoku reemergence, like, you know, because we saw this like one time before with Njoku, like in 2018 or 19 that's really hurt Kareem Hunt. He's just not getting the targets anymore. And so that that's kind of taken away his standalone value. But if something happened to Nick Chubb, we know this is a really good offensive line. We know it's a team that's willing to run the ball. So, man, I would be hard-pressed to not rank Kareem Hunt in the top 12 if something happened to Nick Chubb. Yeah. Um, speaking of running backs who may end up getting an advantage because of a potential injury, uh, Raheem Mostert who was running behind Jeff Wilson ever since Wilson showed up in Miami. Uh, Wilson gets banged up uh, in that game against the Chargers. We'll see what his status is, but this does seem like it opens the door for us to go back to maybe to what we saw earlier in the season, Dwayne, where, where Mostert was sort of yeah. dominating those opportunities in that Miami backfield. Yeah, and Mostert had kind of you know surged to the front the week before, but we didn't know if we could trust it, right? Because to your point, before that, Wilson had handled it. I will say that Mostert was getting more of the work early last week, but then when Wilson came in, he looked better. And I was kind of thinking, you know, we told everybody, you probably can't trust this. It's going to be hot hand. I think it was about to be Jeff Wilson hot hand week. I think he was about to go off. Uh, maybe not go off, but he was going to probably be the back to lead the backfield. Um, but this injury now leaves him day to day. He did not practice today. Um, I do believe, like I'm looking right now, I do believe this is a Saturday night game. Um, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, isn't it the bills and dolphins? Yeah. So yeah, you've got one less, yep, it is yeah, yep. one less game, um, for Wilson to really be ready. So, you know, look, I'm always skeptical when a player gets immediately ruled out and then all of a sudden, ah, yeah, he might play this weekend. Like I just, <laughs> right. you know, and it does happen. We've had it happen actually this year and had to, and, and, you know, we've talked about a few of those, but my guess would be, we do not have Jeff Wilson this weekend. And yeah, that means Raheem Mostert's going to pretty much get all the work. Now, it hasn't been great, Marcus, you know, in yeah. the games where Mostert's had all the work. Like, so in his games where he's had at least 15 opportunities this year, so that, that's adding targets plus his rushing attempts. He's only averaging 12.7 points per game. That's kind of low for, for an offense that's, that's, that is ex, as explosive, right, as the Dolphins. You know, they rank eighth in converting drives to touchdowns. 25% of their drives end in a touchdown score. And so usually when you get a running back that's getting the lead role and they're playing in an offense like that, just by the nature of getting the chance to score the touchdowns, right? They're going to score more points than what we've seen with Mostert. But having said all that, like that opportunity, you can't, it's still there. Like if you're the lead back on a high scoring offense, then you know, you're just going to have an opportunity to score. We, this kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier in the season with Pacheco. And people are like, ah, no, I can't use Pacheco, pass heavy offense. Miami, pass heavy offense, but kind of the same thing. They're probably going to score a lot of points. I know it's been a little rough the last couple of weeks, but I, I think you look at him as a, a low end RB2, but he could still have RB1 spike potential, like if we have Wilson out of the picture. Cause I mean, he's going to have a chance, he could score two touchdowns. 
And you know how this goes. Two touchdowns, you're an RB1 immediately. <laughs> right. <You have> 60 <laughs> yards to go with that total. You're going to be like a high-end RB1 on the week. No, I think you're right. And so we'll keep an eye on Jeff Wilson, as you mentioned, that uh, that one day less to get ready. Also, it's been a rough stretch schedule-wise for the Dolphins. They came out uh, to play the Niners. They lose there. Then they stay in California for the week. They they lose a tough one to the Chargers. And now on a short week, they have to pick up and go to Buffalo, where it's going to be cold. It's going to be a hostile crowd. Uh, the schedule makers did the Dolphins no favors with this stretch uh, that they're going through right now. You mentioned sort of a hot hand situation, and I look at the Bengals. And last week going into that game, my thought was, look, you're probably not playing some Ajay P. Ryan because Joe Mixon is back, but hold on to P. Ryan just because, you know, you never know what's going to happen and he could have a role. Turns out he played more snaps than I thought he was going to. Uh, 42, almost 43% of the snaps there. Ends up scoring a rushing touchdown in the game. So now what, <laughs> I guess, is the question with that Bengals backfield. So this is one where normally it wouldn't make the utilization report. I would need to see another week with this data. But, you know, it's like you mentioned, we're in crunch time now. Like, so we're, we're kind of having to, you know, use the information the best we can to make these decisions. We're trying to win this weekend. I still would, I'm still going to have Joe Mixon as a low end RB1. So I'm not necessarily saying that, like, you know, this data is, you know, changing everything. But I wanted to include it because, you know, people are trying to make those tough decisions. So some people may feel differently than me. but the big thing that I noticed really, you know, Marcus across the board, Mixon was down, um, you know, but the red zone, uh, the red zone work was really down this last week. You saw some Ajay Ryan come in and get almost half of the red zone work. We'd seen Joe Mixon like around 80%, you know, of the red zone, almost like above 80%, you know, so far this season, this last weekend, he was below 50%. And, you know, in a, in an offense that, has shown us they are willing at times to really be pass heavy. Like a big part of his value comes from scoring the touchdowns. Every running back comes from that, but that's what you're banking on. If you really like mixing a lot, right? You're like, okay, plays in a good offense, may not catch a ton of balls, but he's going to have a chance to score touchdowns because he's a really good offense. So that was the biggest thing um, that stood out, you know, that, that kind of had me worried. The other thing, just less work in the passing game. Now the Bengals didn't use the two minute offense this last weekend. They didn't need to. That's something that we've seen Mixon actually have this year. That's been a bonus that we didn't expect him to get, but P Ryan played really well in that role, uh, you know, the two weeks prior. So I do think there's a chance that P Ryan has carved out a little bit of work here. And again, it's, if you have Mixon, you're just probably starting him no matter what. It's just more of you're lowering lowering expectations just a little bit. You know that you know P Ryan could have a little bit larger role. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how this goes this week uh, for the, for the Bengals. But you're right. If you've got if you've got Mixon, you're starting him. It's P Ryan who sort of becomes the wild card uh, in this whole equation. Speaking of wild cards, J.K. Dobbins is back, and I sort of I. I kind of compared him to the McRib and that he went away for a while and he came back and he yeah. could leave again before we know it. Who knows? Um, oh, I think J.K. Dobbins is better than the McRib. But the question becomes now, what do we do with that that Ravens backfield where you got Dobbins, you got Gus Edwards. I mean, Kenyon Drake is still there and, and still gets a few snaps here and there. How are you looking at this this backfield based on kind of what you you've been able to, to divine from the numbers? Yeah, it was really nice for for Dobbins this last week. Like he did come through, you know, for fantasy managers, obviously, you know, 15 rushing attempts, 120 yards. He had the touchdown, had a nice long run. It was well blocked, but, you know, it was fine. You know, he, mm -hmm. you know, you thought he might house that, but it's okay. Like he, he, he did what he needed to do. The problem is it's still only 39% of the rushing attempts, you know, and Gus Edwards was just as much involved. Um, and we talked about this a little bit, you know, with Dobbins when we talked about him as a potential waiver wire ad before. And I think, you know, if I remember correctly, like your concern as well was just like, yeah, but are they really ever going to just let, let this guy go? Mm -hmm. And the answer is probably no. But I mean, he did lead the backfield this last weekend. So even though it was 39%, you know, Edwards was at 34%. So I guess that's saying something. But Kenyon Drake was still involved a little bit too. And this is just one of those offenses where we've seen over the last several years, Marcus, like they're willing to use three backs. And when you're dealing with the injuries they're dealing with and trying to get these guys healthy, I don't know. It could happen, but I struggle to see a scenario where they're just like, hey, JK, we're going to cut you loose until like maybe the playoffs where then it's just like, hey, we're trying to go. It's 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 all or nothing now. We're trying to advance in the NFL playoffs, like not our fantasy playoffs, their playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think Dobbins will be OK. You could look at him as a boom bust RB2. But if I had to decide between Dobbins and my flex spot, 
right? Versus, you know, a wide receiver that we like, like a high end wide receiver three that we know is going to be out there every play and have, you know, an opportunity to maybe have a big week. Like I'm probably leaning to the wide receiver over Dobbins mm-hmm. still. Like, like that's where my head's at. Yeah, I think this this week especially, you know, I I don't know. I mean, I know they they've got a good matchup on paper uh, against the Browns, but it it just feels like a game that's going to be kind of low scoring, kind of a slog, a, a classic AFC North slugfest, and that sort of worries me, especially if he's splitting those opportunities with Edwards and Kenyon Drake, and we're still not sure exactly who's going to be the starting and, quarterback for and, the Ravens. And. <laughs> right, exactly. There's so many there's so many caveats, which basically I guess means maybe maybe stay away from Dobbins if you can. Uh, for putting that many hands on it <laughs> that we've had with the Ravens is every time we've endorsed one this year, like the, the opposite has happened. Yeah, the, so, the I other mean, guys. Exactly. so we're saying no this week. So maybe it's fine. Maybe, so maybe, maybe, maybe go start maybe. JK Dobbins, do the opposite. of Here's the, a, a, an old boss used to tell me, you know, a good handicapper, uh, is equally as effective as a really bad handicapper. You just have to understand who is who and then make your decisions accordingly. So <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, what I do know, for us. right, I know, right? Uh, you just have to figure out what side we're on. I think we're on the good side. I'm going to stay with that. Yeah, um, let's turn over to, to wide receivers because Keenan Allen is back and healthy and has really been a big part of the Chargers passing game. No surprise there at all. Uh, but, you know, since week 11 just has really been a big part of what's going on, really playing some good football and gets an upgrade. I, I keep saying that he's just a guy that we sort of take for granted because it's like, ho hum, here's Keenan Allen. When he's healthy, he gets you his, you know, 11, 1200 yards, his six to eight touchdowns, ho hum. But, you know, let's give the dude credit, man. And, he, and you have him as an upgrade this week. Yeah. Well, ho hum is pretty good, um, especially in 2022 with all the challenges <laughs> we've seen in passing games. And Keenan Allen is actually one of these kind of guys that can benefit, right? He plays inside in the slot. He's Justin Herbert's most trusted option in critical situations over the last four games. 50% of the targets on third or fourth down when the Chargers have to have it are going to Keenan Allen. 55% of the targets in the end zone over the last four weeks are going to Keenan Allen. So he hasn't even necessarily had necessarily had his boom yet. Think of some of these end zone targets are turning into more touchdowns. Like there's just a lot of opportunity here. Um, he gets to play inside, inside from the slot. You know, he's he's primarily, you know, over 60% of his routes come from the slot. Um, you know, 10 and a half targets, man, per game over this last four games. So yeah, it's just an easy one. You know, you have a guy, it's a 25% target share over the last four. But the thing that makes that really work is just the Chargers are so run head or so pass heavy, right? Like every game script, they just keep throwing the ball. Trailing by four plus points, 79%. That's 11 percentage points above the league average. Within three points, 68% of the time they throw the ball. That's plus eight percentage points versus the league average. And then even when they're leading, man, 59% of the time they're throwing the ball leading by four plus points. That's 10 plus percentage points above the actual NFL average. So there's really not a game script that can hurt, you know, Keenan Allen. Um, and with all the looks that he's getting in the end zone, like there's just a lot of room here. Like, and, and, and you just know, Marcus, like you mentioned it, ho-hum. He's going to give you 15, 12 to 15, no matter what. But if some of these other things start coming through for him, like he could have a 30 pointer really, really easily. So I look at him as a high end wide receiver too the rest of the way. Yeah. Which is, is I think where we're sort of drafting him, but the fact that we had to wait a while. Yeah. He's still coming back to to work his way back up. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it just took a while, but, but we're back to getting, I think what we expected out of Keenan Allen. All year long, I have sort of had a a running kind of joke with our own Elliot Christ about Elijah Moore. Um, and look, I came into the season thinking like there were good things going to happen. It took a while. He was unhappy. He was sending out cryptic tweets as wide receivers are wont to do. Uh, but since we've seen Zach Wilson demoted and Mike White step in, Elijah Moore has sort of come back to our life. Now we have Corey Davis, who is in concussion protocol. and We'll see what his status is for the week. But Elijah Moore looks like he's got a good opportunity. He's got a very good schedule down the stretch. So maybe our preseason hopes and dreams can come true for him now? <laughs> well, there's a chance. Um, you <laughs> so know, you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting, too, because like if you say anything about Elijah Moore, because people, you know, the main thing people think of is, Probably I'm not in my fantasy playoffs and I drafted and I drafted Elijah Moore. <laughs> <laughs> However, there are a lot of people that maybe you did draft him and you moved on rightfully so early on. And now, you know, because you cut bait early, you know, you're in the playoffs. And now you're hearing this, you're like, I'm not going back to Elijah Moore. Like I already cut him once. Well, just hear me out. Number one, 74% route participation in week 13. 
Last week, it went to 92%. We had Corey Davis out. And so we now have that door open. You mentioned the head injury. Um, we're in just a scenario where really he's seeing the most utilization since he saw from week six when he requested a trade. And we know what all, we all know what happened after that. <laughs> now he has not been good this year, Marcus, like 13% targets per route, per route run, 0.96 yards per route run. Those are terrible, terrible, terrible marks. However, he was still a second round pick last season. And last year, like, I just can't get it out of my head. Like he had that seven game stretch from week seven to week 13, where he delivered Wide receiver 36, wide receiver 26, wide receiver one overall, 27, (laughs) wide receiver three overall, 42, but then wide receiver eight. He had three games in that stretch where he was in the top 10. And, you know, I mean, he was averaging over 17 fantasy points per game. So we know it's there. We just saw it as recently as last year. And so the way I look at it is if Corey Davis is out, this is a player no one's going to think this, but he has wide receiver two upside. Now you're going to need to be in a deeper league to want to start him you know, in your fantasy playoffs. If you're in an eight teamer, a 10 team league, like he's probably, he's still maybe worth picking up, but you're not going to put him in your lineup this weekend, but you definitely don't want him hanging around the waiver wire. If he gets hot, you know, for one of your opponents. And it's just hard, man, at this point of the year to find someone that fits the profile of, okay, we've actually seen them demonstrate a high upside recently last season in the past. They have a role that's expanding over the last couple of games. He has that. And we have an offense that wants to throw the ball a lot. When this offense has Mike White or Joe Flacco under center, they're completely different. They they throw the ball 63% of the time. That's above the NFL average. When they have Zach Wilson under center, they throw the ball 51% of the time when they're in close games. So it's just two totally different offenses. And as long as Zach Wilson's on the sideline, there's an opportunity for a second person besides Garrett Wilson to step up. I think Moore has as good a chance as anybody. Yeah, and I just I looked at the schedule the last three weeks, or the next three weeks, I should say. Uh, the Lions, uh, the Jaguars, and the Seahawks. So... Uh, there are some matchups that are ripe for the picking. And uh, that also, by the way, this also applies to Garrett Wilson. I mean, we're starting Garrett Wilson. We know how yeah. good he is, but he also gets these same matchups. So uh, that's something to, to kind of file away if you have Garrett Wilson on your roster. Juju Smith-Schuster has been, for me at least, frustrating. I thought good things were coming. It took a while. Then he had a couple of really nice weeks. Then he sort of faded away. Uh, beyond Travis Kelsey, I don't think there's anybody that we can consistently count on there catching the football in Kansas City, but you you have Juju as an upgrade this week, huh? Yeah, and so f- for Juju, it's kind of similar to that last part we talked about with the Jets. You've got a pass-heavy offense, but now you're talking about the number one most pass-heavy offense in the league. It doesn't matter, like we talked about a second ago, leading within three, you know, trailing, it doesn't matter. They're going to, dude, When they're leading by four plus points, they throw the ball 61% of the time. That's 12 percentage points above the NFL average. Like they're plus 11 in neutral situations. So you got a team throwing the ball all the time. I don't have to tell everybody. Also have this elite quarterback named Patrick Mahomes (laughs) throwing you the ball. You already mentioned it. Travis Kelsey's really the only other option that they have. Marquis Fallas Scantley's the next closest guy, Marcus, like 12% target share. It's just not been good. And so when you look at Smith Schuster, he had a couple of games after the concussion. So you you mentioned it. We had to wait. He got hot. Then he got the concussion, came back. Things haven't been so good. But in those games, like we didn't really see him getting the normal utilization that we had seen in the past. So if you just isolate it down to the to the matchups where he's had at least 60 percent, you know, of the route participation um, and you look at it over, you know, these last several weeks. So he has a top eight finish, man, in four of his last five games where he played at least 60 percent of the routes. He's averaging 19.1 fantasy points. Like, so when you put it in that perspective, um, you know, I think there is hope. I don't know if him missing, you know, snaps and that kind of thing was due to injury. If it was due to performance, I really don't have any clue, but if he is going to be on the field, I think we can feel pretty, pretty good about it. And like, he's not elite, man. He's not earning a ton of targets, but 19% targets per route run. When your team throws the ball, like every play, like it, it, you know, we're just doing a math equation here, right? You can have a 30% target share on a team that runs the ball every time, and you can have the same number of targets as a guy that gets a 19% on a team that passes the ball all the time, right? There's different ways to get, you know, to solve the math equation. So Juju's basically what everybody hoped Gabriel Davis would be, right? right. You know, kind of a, a middling talent, but lifted by the offense. And we haven't gotten that out of Gabe Davis. But man, we've seen the booms with Juju, and that's the thing. The booms are there. You know, the, those those outings that we talked about, you know, when you're getting in the top eight four of your last five games, like that's that's tough to have someone like that on your bench. So I think he's a mid-range wide receiver too. He has wide receiver one upside every week. 
Well, you, you mentioned Gabe Davis too, and I think it's it's easy to just kind of pivot to him because you know he was one of the most debated players in fantasy <laughs> before the season. And there was a point of halfway through the season, I, I felt like whatever side of the argument you fell on, you were right. Uh, but lately, it has not been great. Uh, he just has one game, one game with more than seventy receiving yards since week six. Uh, you know, he's he's been in the end zone a couple of times, which just sort of helped him out. But it's at this point, I don't know. If I have Gabe Davis, I don't know that I trust him enough to start him the next yeah. few weeks, especially because the matchups aren't good. He's not seeing the targets. He's not producing. At this point, I think I'm just I'm kind of backed away from Gabe Davis. And we just haven't seen the big booms, you know? I mean, he's kind of the opposite of what we just talked about with Juju. You know, he's had, uh, you know, he's been outside the top 36 in seven of his last 12 games in PPR scoring. You know, so, I mean, he's not really, you know, he's not even getting inside the top 36, much, much less giving you these really big games. So he's really, in my opinion, he's just a boom bust wide receiver four. And I think the Bills definitely have to, they've got to do something this off season because I mean, he just is not earning targets. You know, he's a, he's 15% targets per route run. That's 61st out of 82 receivers with at least 250 routes. That's just not cutting it. Yards per route run, 46th out of 82. And then if you want to isolate down to, okay, great, quarterback play, other things, let's separate all that. PFF receiving grade, 64.8. That's 63rd out of 82 potential wide receivers with at least 250 routes. So mm. there's just not anything to get, like, you know, we're always searching for underlying things to say, okay, well, maybe there's something here. Like when you look at Gabriel Davis and you see how bad he's performed, and then you look at this underlying data and you're like, oh, well, it just makes sense. Like he's just not playing well. Yeah, when you talk about earning targets in Buffalo, the Bills coaxed Cole Beasley out of retirement uh, as somebody who can just maybe get open and give uh, give Josh Allen another target beyond having Stefan Diggs doing all the work there in, in Buffalo for the last few weeks. Um, Before we get out of here, let's get a couple of tight ends. Chig Okonkwo, who we all sort of loved last week as a streamer, and he, he stepped up and filled the bill. And on a team that doesn't really have a lot of consistent pass catchers, I don't see why we would go away from Okonkwo. Admittedly, he's kind of a deeper league guy, but I feel at this point he has done enough to earn consideration for a lot of rosters. Yeah, I think you just have to look at him as a high-end tight end, too, moving forward. I mean, he's got two top eight finishes in a row. Now, both of those games have been without Traylon Burks, right? Burks got hurt at the beginning of week 13 with a concussion on that great touchdown catch. Then last week, we didn't have Burks due to said concussion. So there is a chance, like, there's just more target competition when Burks comes back. But, like, if I'm the Titans, to me, this offense is all about Burks, Okonkwo, and getting the ball to Derrick Henry. Like, those are your explosive playmakers. Like, we know Robert Woods is washed at this point. Like, he's not yeah. done anything all season. I hate to say it. Like, that's a guy that I've just really liked for a long time. Yeah. He's just not working out for Robert Woods. And and they need Robert Woods to earn targets, and he's just not able to right now. Uh, Westbrook Akini has been nice. You know, I think he's kind of surprised some people with some of his performances. But these are the guys that can really make things happen. I mean, he's 25% targets per route run, 2.58 yards per route run. Like, so those are marked. It's a small sample folks like so again i think we mentioned this last week we could totally get albert okwabunum here this is the kind of profile <laughs> we saw with okwabunum um and then he disappointed us so that could always be the case with you know chigozium okonkwo as well but at the same time it's all we have to go off of like we can't just wait forever we can't be well we're gonna have to wait for you to show us this over 500 routes i mean we go off the data that we have <laughs> and he uh, and if you if you look historically those kind of numbers that aligns with some of the best tight ends in the NFL. That that's the kind of numbers that they put up and their underlyings as far as targets per route run, yards per route run. So even though he doesn't have that full time role, I am willing to sign off on him as a high end tight end too. And honestly, like, is it that hard with how bad tight end has been? Like, I mean, uh, like it's not like a huge statement statement to say that I'm signing off on him being a high end tight end too. Like, it's just kind of easy to be in that conversation this year. But I do think his upside is higher than some of the others because he can just come through with the big plays. And when he's on the field, they really like trying to get him the ball. Only out there for 52%, you know, uh, you know, sorry, 50% of the routes last weekend. But 52% of them came from the slot. So they do move him around, do some different things with him. Yeah, and you, you hit on a point I was going to make is that he's a tight end, you know, so um, <laughs> you, know, you, you don't have to show us, a, off, you, know? you don't have to show us a ton to, to kind of get our attention. And I think he's done more than enough at this point. Uh, to kind of close it out, Pat Fryermuth, who you know has been very consistent through his first year plus in in the National Football League. I, you were said monitoring him. Now, is this? 
you know, his usage is it is it the lack of Kenny Pickett? I know that you know Mitch Trubisky and Mason Rudolph are splitting snaps in practice with Pickett uh, having had a head injury. Uh, what is going into your concern about Pat Fryermuth right now? Yeah, so with Fryermuth, number one, this is this is bonus material. This is not in the utilization report this week. The oh. only way you get this is by listening to this podcast today. So congratulations, <laughs> hung around, um, but. It's really his routes, man. I don't know what is going on here, Marcus, but in week 13, only a 55% route participation. Week 14, only 57%. He had been over 80%, and whenever you put the 80% together and the fact that he's a 24% targets per route run guy this season, like that immediately makes you top four consideration. And so he's, again, we come back to your last point about Chig. It's tight end. So there's no way to get Fat Fryermuth out of your tight end one conversation. If you have him, you know, you drafted him, you're probably starting him. But like we know, we also have people here that play DFS, people looking at prop bets, things like that. There's a lot of different ways to use your the utilization data. And hopefully you guys are doing that. But when you look at Fryermuth, like I, I don't know why all of a sudden he's he's their best receiver. Like he's playing better than Deontay Johnson. He's playing better than George Pickens. He's he's honestly he's the best stealer probably right now. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I'd have to look on defense, but on offense, I think he's the best stealer <laughs> this season and they're only playing him half the time. I don't know why. And it's not that he's staying in the block. Like, you know, he's, he's only out there 55 and 57% of the time. Now he's still come through because he had a 29% targets per route run each of the last two weeks because he's awesome. And so he's still going to be fine for you, but it doesn't quite have the upside, right? If he has, if he's out there eighty percent, giving you those kind of targets per route run, dude, like he has a chance to be the number one tight end on any slate. Like, and he'd been playing good enough to maybe start considering him that way. It'd really just been more about Pickett and the other guys probably holding him back. But now, like this, like you just worry. Like, are you, you know, he was he was tight end nine in week thirteen, tight end seven this last weekend. You know, we were he really should be the tight end three or four every week. So he's overcoming it. But there's also a lower floor when you're not going to be on the field as much. Because if, if a team decides to really try to take him away and he has less chances at you know earning his targets, like you know it could just really it could just really give you a bad a bad week, which you want to avoid in the fantasy playoffs. Yeah, uh, T.J. Watt, that would be uh, the answer there for potentially the best stealer. Yeah, been hurt. <laughs> we don't even need to look. That would be the answer. <laughs> T- that, that's T.J. Probably Watt the is... answer for the best stealer. Best uh, best stealer is yeah. probably T.J. Watt, but best offensive stealer very well could be Pat Fryermuth. Yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't argue very hard against that one. So uh, that was just a glimpse at the utilization report with a little bonus, a little Easter egg thrown in for those of you who listen to the podcast, which is our way of saying. We appreciate you downloading and listening to this show. Of course, uh, for more of this information, you can go to fantasylife.com. Check things out over there. While you're there, uh, sign up for the newsletter. I know I say it all the time. I mean it. Sign up for the newsletter. It's uh, informative. It's handy. It comes to you every single morning. You can scroll it while you're you know, eating breakfast, on your commute, doing whatever it is uh, you do to get ready for your day. Of course, uh, Marcus, we'll have more. Some, yeah. Some people are on a budget, man. Like They can't afford this kind of stuff. That's true. You know, look, I get it. Inflation is high. Uh, you know, everybody's everybody's wallets are affected. We are no we are no different. So uh, we're trying to give you as much as we can for uh, as little uh, financially as, as you can can give us. So we, we're certainly grateful for all that. Uh, and we'll be back with you, of course, later on in the week. We'll dive into some rankings and get you ready for week 15, which, by the way, and we'll mention this again, games. Uh, there are games on Saturday. We know we'll have the Thursday night game. There are the Saturday games as well. So something to, to kind of look out for and get you ready for the weekend. So we appreciate you hanging out with us here on the Fantasy Life podcast. For Dwayne, I am Marcus. Take care of yourselves, and we'll talk to you later on in the week.